Hi folks, welcome to today's lesson on chapter 12.4, which is about trig functions. Um, we're going to do this chapter a little bit out of order, and today's lesson is really going to be about recapping the things that we already know about trig, and also developing the graphs of sine and cosine. So things that we already know, in a triangle, the angles add up to 180 degrees, which is pi radians. Uh, in a right triangle, you've got Pythagorean theorem, and also in right triangles, you've got Sokotoa, saying sine of some angle is the opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, tangents opposite over adjacent. 180 degrees is pi radians, and the deeper we get into mathematics, probably the more we'll be using radian measure. We have sine law that works for all triangles. I don't know why there's this negative here, but it should say sine A over a equals sine b over b, or a over sine a equals sine b over sine b. Um, that's for solving for missing sides in triangles where you know an opposite pair, where you know the angle and the side that's opposite it. And cosine law is sort of an adaptation of Pythagorean theorem for any triangle. Area of the triangle can be found with half base times height, which was how we would have found it, say, in junior high school. Or now it's half A, B, sine C. So you need to know two sides and the measure of the included angle. If theta is in radians, arc length has this lovely equation that arc length is just theta r. So when we say arc length, what I mean is if I've got a circle with the central angle of theta, this would be an arc. So if it had a radius of 5, then the size of this arc would just be 5 times theta, whatever theta is. When we say sector area, we've got this nice little formula here. It's a half theta r squared. So sector area is the area of the slice of pi or pizza that you create. That's all sort of recappy stuff. We'll be going in a slightly different direction from here. Last year, we used the unit quarter circle to organize trig values. Um, so let's just refresh our memories on that. I'm going to draw it out. I'll do it in real time for this first one, and from the, here on in, I'll just have it pop in. So here's a circle, or a quarter circle. Uh, right here would be the point 1, 0. Okay. And we would care about different angles here. We'd care about the angle of 30 degrees, and 0 degrees, and 45 degrees, and 60 degrees, and 90 degrees. So in radian measure, 0 is just 0 degrees. 30 degrees is pi over 6, 45 degrees is pi over 4 in radian measure, 60 degrees is pi over 3, 90 degrees is pi over 2. The other point that we can easily pull off a quarter circle is this one here. And on a un unit quarter circle, the x value is the cosine of theta, where theta is that angle that's formed with the positive x-axis. y is the sine of theta and y over x would be the tangent of theta. So I'll just get rid of this and write that in. y over x is tan theta. And that leaves us with a couple of other points to fill in. And to fill them in, it's as easy as 1, 2, 3. So it's going to be over 2, over 2, over 2. And the cosines go 1, or root 1, root 2, root 3. The sines go 1, root 2 over 2, root 3 over 2. So now we know sine and cosine for some important angles, and we developed these from looking at uh, special triangles last year. This is just a way to organize it. The next thing we did last year was we expanded this idea of a quarter circle to a half circle. So I could do the same thing. And so I'll have all these different angles. I'll get them to pop up. So there's the half circle with all the important numbers written in. And you could keep going. You could find what's going on at 120 degrees. Now notice for 120 degrees, we'd have the same y values we had for 60. And the x would just turn negative over here. So apparently cosines of angles bigger than 90 are going to be negative. Now, one way that you can think about this is by thinking about a reference angle. 60 and 120 both have the same reference angle of, uh, of 60 degrees. So that means they're going to have 
the same numbers for sine and cosine as each other, though whether they're positive or negative might change. And so in this first quadrant, sine, cosine, and tangent are all positive. In the next quadrant, right over here, you'd only get sine is positive. Because the x values, cosine would be negative, obviously. And tangent would be negative because y over x, or a positive over negative, is going to be negative. So we've taken the idea of a quarter circle. We've expanded it to a half circle. I could put in more numbers there. But hopefully at this point, it becomes clear that all the numbers are actually on the quarter circle. It's just deciding whether they're positive or negative once you have that reference angle. It will come as no surprise that if we expand it from a quarter circle to a half circle, well, we can expand to a full circle. And that way we can define trig ratios for 360 and even beyond. And you might say, well, what's beyond 360? We're defining these angles as coming out of the positive x-axis and going counterclockwise. So there's 270 there. But there is such a thing as further than 360, because you could make a rotation that's beyond 360 degrees, and you could go around and around and around and around. And also, you could have negative angles, angles going backwards, which in this case would mean going clockwise from the x-axis. So angles can be positive or negative, if we think of them in sort of in standard position like this. And they can also uh, take values bigger than 360. So that brings us to a big old filled in unit circle, the whole thing. And we already said that x is cos theta and y is sine theta. And that property holds for the first quadrant and for the second quadrant and for the third. So at this point, if what you wanted to do was find the cosine of, say, uh, I don't know, 240 degrees, you could go to 240 degrees and say, huh, I wonder what the x value is there. Ah, it's negative a half. If you type in cos 240 degrees in your calculator, and it's in degree mode, then it will tell you exactly that. So this lets us organize all of our values. But again, all the numbers were contained in the first quadrant. After that, it's just deciding how far uh, further than the first quadrant we're going and whether it's positive or negative. And there's a cute little trick for deciding positive or negative. In the first quadrant, all the ratios are positive. In the second quadrant, only sine is positive because only y would have a positive value. Let's skip to the fourth quadrant. Only cosine would be positive in this quadrant because x would be positive. And in the third quadrant, both x and y would be negative, so tangent would be positive. So what's positive? In the first quadrant, it's all. In the second quadrant, it's sine. In the third quadrant, it's tangent. In the fourth quadrant, it's cosine. Now, that looks like a daunting amount of stuff to, say, regurgitate on a test. But what we're going to do is try and use all these values, and we have a whole bunch of them here, to develop the graph of sine theta. So just to recap up to here, the unit circle is a tool to organize trig values. Uh, the unit circle is centered on the origin. It has a radius of 1. If you wanted to know its equation, it's x squared plus y squared equals 1. And the equation of any circle with the radius r that's centered on the origin is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. On the unit circle, x values cosine, y values sine, y over x is tan. We can use the values on the unit circle to generate the graphs of y equals sine theta and cos theta. And that's what we'll do right now. So here's what I'm wondering. What's the graph of y equals sine? Maybe we'll call it y equals sine theta, where theta is the angle that we make. So all I'm doing is just sort of cataloging and sketching what's going on at each of these angles. What is sine? So, so the sine of 0 would be this number here, 
zero. At zero degrees, the sine is zero. At 30 degrees, the sine is a half. So let me put in 30 degrees would be about here. And I'll make this one, so a half would be about here. At 45 degrees, the sine is root 2 over 2, which is about 0.7-ish. Okay, so maybe here. And at 60 degrees, the sine is 0.866, or root 3 over 2. And at 90 degrees, the sine is 1. So here's what we know about the graph so far. It looks like this. Now, we could go through and we could find the sine at a whole bunch of other values. Let's just pick the most important ones, though. Like, if I'm at 0 degrees, that's my point on the unit circle. If I'm at 90 degrees, here's the point. If I'm at 180, here's the point. And if I'm at 270, here's the point. And we're talking in degrees here for now. So the sine of 180 is 0. Okay, at 180, the sine is 0. And we could pick up more values on the way if we wanted to. At 270 degrees, the sine is negative 1. And at 360 degrees, so if we went all the way around, the sine would be back to 0. Now I can put in more stuff in between, but I guarantee you that this just smoothly connects in the same kind of shape. And you may have seen this graph before, or this shape before. There's a sine graph. What do we notice about it? Well, from 0 to 360, it goes through an up part and a down part, and then back to where it started. It's vertically symmetrical about the x-axis. It goes to a max of 1 right here, and a min of negative 1 right here. The other thing that's wild, though, about this function is that you can keep going. So somewhere out here, we're going to have 450 degrees. Guess what? The sine of 450 degrees is going to be back up to the top. It's going to be 1 again. So this is what will happen. This graph will just keep going and going in the same pattern. And that's the first time we've really seen a graph do that, just repeat the same pattern over and over again. But we know lots of phenomena in nature repeat themselves over and over again. If we think about temperatures, seasons, the amount of daylight in a day, the tides, Lots of functions that repeat themselves again and again. If we went to negative angles, it would continue like this. So really what the graph does is it does a cycle, and then again, and again, and again, forever and ever. If we did cosine, then it would be the same sort of idea. So I'll type in, or I'll write in 90, 180, 270. 360, and I can see that the cosine of 0 degrees is 1. So again, this is really cos theta, though eventually we'll probably think of it as cos x, where x is our variable. So the cosine of uh, 0 is 1. The cosine of 30 degrees is root 3 over 2, which is about 0.866. The cosine of 45 degrees is 0.7-ish. And the cosine of 60 degrees is 0.5. So I've kind of got this shape happening. And I'll think about the full unit circle again, but I'll, I'll just worry about those sort of angles that are right on the axes. And it'll tell me the values of cosine. At 90 degrees, the cosine is 0. We actually already knew that. At 180 degrees, the cosine is negative 1, so I better put that in. At 270 degrees, the cosine is 0. And if I went all the way around to 360, the cosine would be back to 1. So the basic look at the graph, I think this will work out better for you on paper than it does on the iPad. kind of looks like this. And if you look at this graph and the last one, they pretty much have the same shape. If you started the sine graph right here, it would look exactly like the cosine graph. They're the same shape. They're both called sinusoids. Both of these are symmetrical about the x-axis. They go up to a max of 1, a min of negative 1. And just like sine, 
this one's going to continue on and do its thing over and over again. So at 450 degrees, the cosine would be zero. So we go back down and back up again. And if we went in the negative direction, it would go down and back up again. The graph of cosine really just sort of starts at one and it does its thing over and over again and also does it backwards to the negative angles. So at this point we have the graph of sine and cosine. I always think of the first sort of 360 degrees as the default uh, portion of the graph that you'd show, but you can really show any part of it. Also notice that if we did this in radians, that 360 would be 2 pi, and that's really the only thing that would change. If you want to see a visualization of this graph um, that's sort of more nice and, and computer generated, you could check out the video that's in the description below. There's a YouTube link, uh, and it's also right here, though of course you can't click the screen. That's about all we want to accomplish today, is just to say that there are graphs of sine and cosine. We'll be able to mess with them, and they look like this and this. Take care, and I'll see you for the next lesson.